All right, we're in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. Well, how's Romans going for you so far? I got a great up here. Two greats. We're going to cover two verses today. Yeah, we covered one verse last week. And, and I want to tell you, I, I, I appreciated, um, I learned, learned a lot where people, where we're at spiritually, there was a lot of great comments made, there was a lot of great questions that was asked last week. And, you know, it lets you know there's still, we still don't understand a lot of things about spirit. Uh, we're trying to grow in that, we're trying to, to gain access. But I want to tell you this morning, Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6. If you miss the truth in those two chapters, you, you, you know, you're going to miss out on the whole thing. You've got to understand what took place for you and for me the day that we entered Jesus. We spent some time last week and we were talking about the term, into, in Christ. And you see that all the way through. Um, just on a side note, I years ago I sit down with my Bible because I started seeing like in the book of Ephesians, you know, in is an active, it's an active word to something. And I was going through the book of Ephesians and I kept seeing in Christ Jesus in Christ, in Him, in the Lord. And it was all over the book. And so I just took a map color, blue map color. I just, every time, I just start marking in Christ Jesus, in Him, in the Lord. And when I got done, just to that blue, you had blue all over the place. And you see where everything happens. A person must be in Christ to receive any of the blessings. And Romans 5 and 6 starts taking us. Here's what happened. When we hit Romans 6 and he talked about your baptism, baptism was more than just being dunked, you know. It, it had meaning and he spent a chapter explaining what that meaning was of being in Jesus. Well, now that you and I have been baptized into Christ, look at chapter 8, look at verse 1. He says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now. So we've already covered being in Christ Jesus through baptism. Now, what is the present status now? No condemnation. Now, we have moved from law, from outside, into grace. And being in the grace of God, and that Romans 6 speaks about that, being in the grace of God, you are now in the favor. See, being under God's grace brings great favor from God. And now that you bring favor from God, is this a great blessing? Now we have no condemnation. Now we have the grace of God that's watching over us. The only question is, would we, will we believe that? Well, look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. He calls him the Spirit of life. It's the Spirit of God is the one that gives the life of God within an individual. He's going to explain that this morning to us. But the spirit of life is the result 
of finding no condemnation. There has to be a cleansing first before the spirit of life is given and infused into our being. There has to be. You know, uh, I know this class isn't a study of the Holy Spirit, but we've got to study a little bit about the Holy Spirit in order to gain this insight, don't we? So here we have in two verses two huge blessings in Christ Jesus. No condemnation and a spirit of life setting you free from everything else. Well, and we're not going to go through these, but verses 3 through 8, the, showing that the seriousness now that we have in Jesus, you better set your mind on the right things. Let me tell you, your mind in Christ Jesus is one of the most important things that you can do. And so you and I have got to set our minds. Are we going now to walk by the Spirit? Are we going to set our minds on the things of the Spirit? And again, he's going to show this. Well, when we get down to verse 9, this was the verse we covered last week. We're going to get past 10. I'll trust me there. When we get to verse 9, he's going to say, this, teach us, this is the reality of now. This is the reality of the spirit of life. Verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, there is a condition. What's, this, what's the condition that we just read? Don't go any further than what we read. You have to what? Yes, the Spirit of God. And we're talking about the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, now that you and I have no condemnation, now that we receive the spirit of life, he says, now you're no longer in the flesh. The flesh, that's how people live before they come into Jesus. It's all these natural tendencies that we have and all the ways that we think. That's what our flesh is. People just live what we call Naturally. God doesn't have need for that because that natural way of living is what separated you from Christ. He has no need for that. And so now that there's been a cleansing, now that the, that the spirit of life is in you, there needs to be a change. And the number one thing is that we have to recognize we are no longer in the flesh if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, what if you don't have the Spirit of God? You're in the flesh. Great point. Look at the rest of verse 9. Well, I, look back real quick at chapter 6, verse 6. Let me show you something. Here's, here's how that happened. Just one verse. He's talking again about baptism. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with, that we would no longer be slaves to sin. What happened to our old self? It was crucified with Jesus. Now we have no need for that. Now we need to go a different direction. And so he says back over here in chapter 8, verse 9, 9 However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. I want you to see that. The Spirit of God dwells in us. And when we talk about the Spirit of God dwelling, i got to point out to you, it's, He's not something you feel. Oh, I can feel. It. No. If he was something you could feel, you could use your senses to, 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 you know, to know. No, he has to be spoken about. He has to be talked about because the Spirit of God 
is a promise as a result of being cleansed. And so that's what he's explaining. He indwells us through a promise. And so now, the end of verse 9, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. What is a must? Do you have to have the Spirit to belong to the Lord? Do you think you and I need to understand that we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us? How important is that? Go ahead. Yes, sir. Oh. Right. That, and Ron makes a very good point. There's only two positions, he said, that you take. You're either condemned or you're in Christ. That's the only two positions. There is not an alternative to this. And, and you're exactly right. I want you to see something else here in verse 9. Some of you may have it marked in your Bible from times past that have taught. But he says here in verse 9, and look how he intermingles this. However, you're not in the flesh but in the Spirit if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now notice what he calls the Spirit. Then he calls him what? The Spirit of God. Now, end of verse 9, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, why in the world would you bring up the Spirit? Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ. They are. They're all one and the same. If you have the Holy Spirit, you got the Spirit of Christ. You got the Spirit of God. They are all one and the same. Jared makes a good point there. And so, you know, if, there, if you don't have the Spirit of God, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, if you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Jesus. So it's important for you and I, you know, to understand what, he, what he's dealing with um, let's continue, verse 10. And notice what he calls them here at the beginning of verse 10. If Christ is in you, huh? if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now I think most of your Bibles, most of our translations have it, if you notice here in verse 10, he, call, he, he calls the Spirit is alive. You ought to have a small S on that. Most of your versions have that. That's your Spirit. You and I have a Spirit, don't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here in James 1, he says a body without the Spirit is dead. When the body ceases to exist, that's because your spirit has left your body. Well, here he's talking about your spirit is alive. What happened to your body with sin? Yeah, it's, it's dead. Yeah, the body is dead because of sin. And I want to tell you, if people don't want to believe that. Sin affects your body. It always has, and it always will. But if Christ is in you, your body side, this physical side that you and I see, is dead. We see it marching dead all the time, don't we? But what has God done on your spirit side? I hear mumblings. What's God done on your spirit side? Your spirit side 
is the deepest part of who you and I are. It's the spirit side of you and I that God works through to get our attention, to grow us. Um, make sure I got the right verses. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me show you real quick. First Corinthians chapter 2. When he talks about that the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. That's God's righteousness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, now what we're going to be reading about, the apostles are talking, Paul is speaking, here's how the apostles got their teaching. Not talking about how the church got theirs. It's how the apostles got their teaching. In 1 Corinthians 2, look down at Verse 10. He said, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, the us there being the apostles. Okay? For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. First off, what do you learn about God's Spirit? He searches the depths of God. So even God's Spirit searches God's depths. Verse 11. For who among men knows the thought of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Who knows your thoughts? Only you. Only you know your thoughts. Your spirit within you knows your thoughts. You know, that's a great illustration right there. There's no such thing as mind readers. They can't. It's impossible. No one knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of that individual. He says in verse 11, Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Who knows God's thoughts? God's spirit. Well, knowing that, he continues on in verse 12. Now we have received, we're talking to the apostles in this particular case, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. I want you to see the depths of the spirit of God. The Spirit of God knows the depths of God, just like only your spirit knows your own thoughts. You and I, when a person is immersed into Christ, they are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Knowing that, the Spirit of God, back in chapter 8, come back again, verse 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. What happened within you upon receiving the Spirit of God? It may, he made your spirit alive through His righteousness. He's trying to show us the righteousness of God. Does He know the depths of God? Wow, what does that mean for us? Look at verse 11. He's going to explain this. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. What does He just say? What did the Spirit of God do to Jesus? He raised Him from the dead. How did Jesus come from death? Spirit of God. Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead 
And now what would we expect from the Spirit of God in us? Give you life within your being. There's a new change. There's a new change that happens. The moment a person enters Christ, their sins are forgiven, they're washed free, the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to them, and now what happens within their being? Give them life. And so, if you and I believe these things he's writing here, what in the world are we going to do? Are we going to set our minds now on the things of our flesh? Is that where we need to go back to? Let's face life through what we always faced in our previous times before entering Jesus. And many of us did go back. What are we learning here? What are you learning? Yes. Oh, absolutely. But not talking about man, though. He's, or he's talking about man, not, not about God. Yes, yes, good point. Good point. Yes, sir. Sure, absolutely. That's... Yeah, and, and God, God's trying to, he's, He gives life to our, what? Our mortal bodies through His Spirit. What was the body, if you remember in Romans 6, what was our body used for? Fire. Whatever the flesh wanted, our bodies were used for sin and death, right? That's what we served. We served ourselves, we served sin, it, the death as a result. Now that we're in Jesus, you have the Spirit of God that dwells in you. You have to have the Spirit of God or you don't belong to God. And if the Spirit is alive now within because of the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, then guess what's happening? Now that same Spirit can give life to your mortal body so you no longer serve your body after sin. You don't have to do it anymore. Does that make sense? Good. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Immortality? Well, yeah, God is immortal. Now, we're going to be, but we're still gonna, we still have some things to face in this life. Huh? Right. But the life that we have in Christ is to stop sin from using my body for its purpose anymore. That's the whole point he's trying to make through this. This is such valuable teaching for all of us in Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's what he's driving at here. It, yeah, read it again, verse 11 with me. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. Now, I won't say any more. We're going to let the next verse begin to explain what he means. Verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Are we under obligation now to our flesh?
Let's say tomorrow you get a bill in the mail from some unknown. Say you owe a thousand dollars. What would you do with it? You've never done business with them, but you owe a thousand dollars. What would you do with it? You throw it away. You have no indebtedness. You have no obligation. We got a bill the other day here at the building, and and uh, pay five hundred and something dollars immediately for some kind of uh, upkeep of of uh, advertisements, and. Handed it to me. I was looking at it. And I said, "Were well, you supposed to pay that?" And down there, in very small letters, uh, this is a solicitation, not a bill. You know. Now, what do you think we're going to do that? Now, the way it was written, it looked like that they were taking care of that and charging you. Throw it in trash. On our flesh, we're not obligated to do and follow the flesh anymore. We, we don't have to follow what our flesh wants to follow. You can be free from all of that. Let him take it to the next step. Verse 13. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. What if you're responding to your natural fleshly nature now that you're in Christ? And he says, you said you're going to, they're going to die? Notice the one word he uses. You must. You don't want to come into Jesus and not have any more interest, not have any idea that you've got a spirit of life that dwells in you, that you're under no condemnation, and then you walk back in and you just keep living the way you lived? You know what must happen to you? You've got to die again, spiritually. You're going to die because you're throwing everything away. If God's trying to help you and I through, and so you must die. There, there's, no, there's no getting around it. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what must God do? What did he do? Do you let them stay in the garden and enjoy all the beauty and the perfection? It, said, it says in, in Genesis 3.24, he drove them out. He drove them out and he stationed a cherubim at the entrance of the garden. The flaming sword turned every direction. They had no way back in here. Now that we have Jesus, there is a way back in. But see, he wasn't going to let them stay in all of that. Um, what happened to the people in the world in the days of Noah? They die? You must. You're going to keep walking according to your flesh. You're going to keep walking with sin. You're going to keep, you know, the same old mindset. You must die. And you got a whole world. There were eight people that survived it because they were found righteous in the eyes of God. Why do you think God destroyed Jerusalem three times? Obliterated it. Unrighteousness. And you know what God used to destroy Jerusalem? What did He use? Unrighteous nations. But the unrighteous nations weren't as unrighteous as God's own people. So, the point being, if you're going to live according to flesh, you must die. That's, there's just no getting around that. Look at the middle of verse 13. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Tell me a function of the Spirit of God. Tell me one of His functions. Just what we read. He's there to help you put to death the deeds of your body. That's what the Spirit of God's there for. 
You know, you, you know, some people come into Christ, but they have bad language. I'll just use that. It's the only thing I can think of. They have bad language. They've always, their flesh just lived off of bad language. Didn't think about using it. Now that you're in Jesus, what should you be doing? No, you've got to stop that. And so if you will use the element God gave you from His Spirit, stop it. You put it to death. Oh, it's going to want to crop back up. It's going to want to use your body again. But if you understand you have Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, that you can stop these things and you began to put to death those things that corrupted you, you're going to keep living. You get better and better and better at living. Doing the righteousness of God. Everybody get that? that that's why this is huge. This is where we fail. So many times people talk about you know, I can't help myself. People get enslaved to different things. Oh, they got to do this. Got They don't understand. There is a way out. There is a way out. Years back, I had a, uh, he was a, fr a friend of mine, still is today. He was a friend of mine, and he was a, he was a smoker. And, you know, he'd come to the conclusion, I don't need to be smoking anymore. So we were talking about it one night, and he just told me, he said, I got to put these things down. Okay, put them down. Well, time went on, and he'd come back. I can't put them down. I can't put them down. All right. Do you need the grace of God? Oh, do I ever need the grace of God? You need God's favor to help, right? Yeah. When you put them down, was it there? Did you find help? I don't think so. Tell me why. Because I'd go pick up my pack of cigarettes and smoke again. So what he was doing was going right back to it. Rather than there was no desire within. You know, the grace of God's powerful. The grace of God, it's not, it's not magical. It's not mystical the way he works. But that's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead you and I can overcome things in our bodies if we would submit and set our minds on the things after the Spirit. And the power will be there. And I told him that. Or else, God lied to every one of us. That's the only two choices. Well, to this day, I told you we're still friends. To this day, he's walked away from the Lord. Because he never could overcome. Never could. And that was just one incident, okay? There could be many other things. But I'm just trying to show you how enslaving things become. There's a power of God to help. But you and I can be set free. Well, look at verse 14. We're getting ready to end this up. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Here's the qualifying verse. What do you learn? Two things. Two things are going to determine. What are they? You allow, yes. Being led by the Spirit. Now the other one, are we going to set our minds? Because he's just talked about that earlier in the chapter. Are we going to set our minds after things of the Spirit? And then are we going to let the Spirit of God lead? Again, it's not magical. It's not something you're going to feel come over you. The fact is, God said, this is where I want you to walk. I will walk there. I might stumble, but I'm going to walk there. And if you let God lead you, what does that prove? Okay, what does he say? What does that prove? 
Yep, you're a son of God. You're one of his children. Because that's what you're doing. You're responding to what God wants done. And that's the way it works. You have to be willing to be led if you're going to make it. And that's the secret to this whole thing. This whole chapter is about the Spirit of Christ, Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And again, he's not something you feel. He's not of a sense. He's the promise. This is the way it is. And this is how I work. Thoughts or questions? Yes, ma'am. There you go. Makes a great point, Reedy does, about our words. They can, they can, they, we need to bring them in within our being. Good words, gracious words. And she said Proverbs speaks of how they heal the bones. They do affect our bodies and what we do and what we say. Thank you so much. We'll take off next week from there. Thank you.